Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship here in First United Church in Kelowna, British Columbia. My name is Bob Wallace, and I'm one of the ministers here at First United. My colleague Cheryl Perry is away on vacation this week, and we all envy her her time at the lake. Joining me in leading worship today is our Minister of Music, Francis Chasen, not only providing great musical leadership, but also going to be assisting in the spoken leadership as well. Reading the scriptures today is Moira Pritchard, and leading the prayers of the people is Martha King, zooming in from far away. <laughs> Technical support is being provided by Mike Chasen, John Whitehead, and Sophia Chasen. But most significantly, gathered here are each one of you, coming from wherever you are, ready to lend your presence and your spirit to this worship service. Thank you for joining us, whether on Zoom, cell phone, Facebook, YouTube, or through our website. And now wherever you are, we're going to begin by acknowledging that we live on and in the lands of those who came here before us. For many generations, indigenous peoples of this continent lived and walked this land and claimed it as their own. Their souls and their spirits are part of the ground we walk on. Their lives intertwined with the soil and the vegetation, the rocks and the waters. Here in the central Okanagan, we gratefully gather on the unceded territory of the Sailk peoples, the Okanagan and West Bank nations. We recognize their love and stewardship for these lands and offer ourselves to partner with them in tending to creation and to our relationships one with another. We also acknowledge this morning that First United Church seeks to be a safe place for all people to worship, regardless of race, creed, age, cultural background or sexual orientation, or whether we're gathered in person or online. This is a place of God's people gathered in safety. And so as we begin, we begin also with the recognition of our commitment to honor all our people, and we gather in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we will light a candle. Assuming this thing match stays. To remind us not only that Christ is the light of the world, but that we are called to walk in that light and to spread that light to all we meet. I'd invite you to join us. Come to our God, all who hunger for life. For it is God who nourishes us at the table of grace. Come to our God, all who are worn out by life. For it is God who provides the rest we need. Come to our God, all who are weighed down. For it is our God who carries our burdens with us. And we join in our first hymn. We're going to sing, Let My Spirit Always Sing. Oh, my body. 
This morning we're going to use the words of uh, the book of Romans in the translation from the message uh, by Eugene Peterson as a way of shaping our prayer of reconciliation. We all know that there are things we intend and there are ways that we live. And so I invite you to join us in these prayers. I know that all God's commands are spiritual. But I'm not. I decide one way. But then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. I decide to do good. But I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad. But then I do it anyway. I truly delight in God's commands. But the power of sin sabotages my best intentions. My decisions to do good don't result in actions. Sin is there to trip me up. I've tried everything. Who can help me? It sort of sounds simple. We even think it's too simple. But which would you rather carry? Hate or love? Anger or forgiveness? Pain or peace? God invites us to receive the gifts which make it possible to have lives of faithful obedience. So this is good news. God forgives us and takes our burdens from us. We can let go of them and welcome hope joy, grace into our lives. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. This is the point at which Cheryl normally says, good morning everybody, I'm so glad to see you and I have missed seeing you, so I'll say it for her. She's away and we're going to miss her for this Sunday and the next couple of Sundays. But we're going to carry on with the Word for All Ages, and we're going to continue to try to tell the stories that come to us from our faith of these uh, amazing, strange, wonderful, humorous, sad, disturbing people that are part of our heritage in the faith. There are going to be two videos here. The first, we get to hear the song again, which introduces this whole season of family ties. And then we're going to hear the story of Eliezer, Eliezer was one of Abraham's servants, and he was sent off on a quest. And so we'll hear his story, and then after that, we're going to hear more about that story. John, thank you. Abraham and Sarah were as old as could be. I just have to sit down to rest. I'm not so young anymore. I am Eliezer. I'm Abraham's chief servant. He has always been very kind to me. In fact, 
He adopted me like a son. I've lived with his family for a lot of years. I was there when Isaac was born. Abraham and Sarah were very happy. They had always wanted to have a child of their own. God promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have many children and grandchildren and even great-grandchildren, as many as the stars in the sky. When Isaac was old enough, Abraham sent me to find a wife for him. He sent me on a journey back to the land where Sarah and Abraham's relatives lived. So I set off with my ten camels and many gifts to do the best job I could. When I reached the city of Nahor, I stopped by the well where the women came to get water. I prayed for God's help to choose a wife for Isaac. Some women came along to get water from the well. One of the women offered me a drink. I was very hot and thanked her for her kindness. She then offered to bring some water for my camels to drink too. I could tell she was a very kind and loving person. So I thought, she is just the kind of caring, loving person that should marry Isaac. So I asked her her name. She told me her name was Rebecca. Then I asked if I might visit her family and stay with them for a few days. And that's the story of how I helped Isaac meet his wife, Rebecca. Family ties make us happy and sad Tells the things that happen that we good and bad But whatever we do, we are loved, you see For we are a part of God's family Family, family And now a part of our family Maura is going to offer us the scripture reading that picks up that story where Eleazar is at the well and having a conversation and then has gone to meet Rebecca's home. A reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, Book of Genesis. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and male and female servants and camels and donkeys. Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old and he has given to him all that he has. My master made me swear saying, you must not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live but you shall go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. So today I came to the well and said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if you will now give me success in my task, I'm standing by the well of water and let it be that when the virgin comes forth to draw water and I say to her, please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And she says to me, drink and I will also draw for your camels. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down to the well and drew water. Then I said to her, please let me drink. She then quickly let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels a drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels a drink as well. Then I asked, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore for him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and bracelets on her wrists, and I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord, and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, who had led me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. And now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. 
Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, This thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Then the servant brought out jewels of silver and gold and clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then they ate and drank, he and the men who were with him, and stayed all night. The next morning they arose, and he said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman remain with us a few days, at least ten. After that, she may go. So he said to them, Do not delay me, seeing the Lord has given me success. Let me go, that I may go to my master. They said, We will call the girl and ask her. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. They blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the men. So the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac came from the Negev. Isaac went out in the evening to meditate in the field, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and surely the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel and said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. So Isaac brought her into the tent of his, his mother, Sarah, and he took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. These are the words from our ancient texts for the day. Laura, thank you for that. That was very well read. And it's so wonderful to see you on the screen today. Things have gone disastrously for Abraham's family, just in case you haven't been following the story. This is the fifth week of trying to sort out this complex man and his family. If I were being kind, I might suggest that Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, and a whole host of other folk are doing their darndest to put the funk in dysfunctional families. So many things have fallen apart. And now after that disastrous test with Isaac on, on Mount Moriah last week, Sarah died. Some commentators suggest she died after learning what Abraham tried to do to Isaac. And Isaac has left home. Now, the scriptures suggest he's 30, but I think he didn't want to be too close to his father in case dad decided to repeat the test. To make matters worse, Isaac has set himself up in his new lodgings near the well called the well of the living one that sees me. This is about 50 miles away from his father. It's the traditional place where Hagar and Ishmael settled after Abraham gave them the boot. So amidst all this turmoil, our patriarch Abraham decides, I've got to get Isaac a proper wife, not one of these local girls. He deserves better. We'll get him one from back home, where girls know how to treat an important man like my son. Yet Abraham doesn't trust Isaac to make the journey himself. So he sends his wily senior servant back with instructions to resolve the problem. And that's where the story that happens uh, that Moira read this morning begins. What she read was the dialogue between Eliezer and Rebecca's family. Eliezer has gone off on a 400 mile journey, laden with gifts and with 10 thirsty camels. And I suspect a whole host of other servants who will do his bidding because after all, 
he is an important representative of Abraham. I don't want you to think that I'm making light of this story, that I'm treating it without seriousness, but it is a funny story. There are a number of other funny parts to it. Now, imagine in your heads. Rebecca's come to draw water from a well. She's got one of those earthen jugs that you carry water in, and water weighs about 10 pounds a gallon. So it's pretty heavy stuff. She offers to draw water for the camels. But one camel can drink 20 to 30 gallons of water at a time. And there are 10 of them. It seems Rebecca is not only beautiful, but maybe she's extremely or freakishly even strong. Her brother Laban may be appropriately hospitable and, and even sounds pious and religious. But it doesn't hurt that he's first seen the gold jewelry that Abraham's servant gave to his sister. And there's one more really humorous part that doesn't come through in the English translation. When Rebecca, after her long journey, at last sets eyes on her intended, the Hebrew text very plainly says she falls off her camel. So what a great story, filled with drama and humor, with overtones of tragedy and faithfulness. It's a lot more fun to read than last week's sermon. But up to this point in the story that we've been reading, God has taken a very active and vocal part in the events. God speaks. God sends water in the wilderness. God provides guidance. God asks questions. God tests. Here, it's almost as if God is silent. It's hard to see God at work in this story. This story reminds me very much of those normal human stories that aunts and uncles tell one another about themselves and the generations before and after them. And they tell them over and over and over again at every family gathering. You know those stories. Somebody starts a story by saying, do you remember when? And then goes on to tell what happened to one of the relatives. Or perhaps it was your parents. Or maybe even you. This story starts with the death of one person, Sarah. It moves on to concern for a second, Isaac. It introduces an essential new person, Rebecca, and it seems to have a happy ever after ending. And like all the stories that the relatives tell, there are lots of jokes, there are strange twists, and once in a while somebody even corrects one another over the history or the fact. But there's one difference from most of the stories we hear our families tell. Each one of the people in this story seems to believe that what's going on is from God. It's God's will, God's plan, God's choice. It seems the story is being told to try and tell us that God is at work, bringing God's plan and will to life in the midst of these very human people and their convoluted relationships. Listen, for example, to what Rebecca's brother and father say. This thing comes from the Lord. We can't speak to you anything bad or good. Let it be as the Lord has spoken. The narrative reflects the conviction that all events are under God's care, that God will bring events to a good end. Everything is in God's hands? How did they know? And even more importantly, how could we know that God might be actively involved in our lives today? The story seems to be telling us that God is steadfastly faithful to God's people, then and now. And that we are invited, like Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Eliezer, 
we're invited to follow God and trust that in God all things are possible and that it will work out right in the end. But how can we know that? How can we have the same assurance this story talks about? Well, as you might expect, ministers have a possible answer. And when I say it, it's going to sound as odd and maybe as laughable as trying to haul water to 10 thirsty camels in a fairly small pottery jug. From the perspective of this story, we can see God's steadfast faithfulness and involvement only by looking in the rearview mirror. Eliezer must have had been filled with worry at the task set for him. He even asks what he's to do if the woman he finds will not follow him back to marry Isaac. As things go on, he prays for guidance and comes to discover that his prayers and events fall into place nicely with his mission. Rebecca's family is willing to let her go. Rebecca herself is willing to go. And so everything works out. And looking back as they tell the story, all the signs of God's faithfulness in all these things can be seen. This is a remarkable story. It's just as complex then, now when we try to apply it for our own lives, though, as it was then. How do we know the leading of God in our lives? How can we be sure that it's God who's leading us and not our own desires or somebody else's conniving like a mother or a father. The story offers a hint. The story gets told over and over again. And as it is told time after time, everyone comes to see that God's leading in this situation is consistent with God's leading at other times. One story leads to another and the connections are seen. So in this story, the ability to see God at work comes in the storytelling, in the laughter and the teasing and the challenging that occurs as the story is told over and over again. The community, the people who hear the story, these are the ones who discern, who to see that God is steadfast and faithful, not just from this story, but from all the previous stories of God's faithfulness and from the things that are happening around them that day. One commentator writes, the text provides an important opportunity to help persons think about faith, about what it is and how it comes. In a culture like ours, which grasps for visible signs of faith, which is driven towards scientism and which falls for too many religious quackeries, this story stands as a foil against easy and mistaken faith. The workings of God are not spectacular, not magical, not oddities. Disclosure of God comes by steady discernment by readiness to trust the resilience that is present in the course of daily affairs. There is an understatedness about the action of the narrative, but it, the narrative is not reticent about faith. It's an understatement that is ready to be sustained and profoundly grateful as we hear the stories. And that's where we find ourselves as well. We are the ones who tell these stories and so many others. Stories that speak of God's presence and faithfulness amid the messy business of living as human beings, even amid pandemics. As we live our lives surrounded by these stories, as we tell them over and over again to family and friends and even in church, together we come to see as if in that rearview mirror where God has been at work in our lives. Knowing these stories also helps us face current and future events, confident that God has been present with us in our journey to this point, that God is still with us, 
and that God shall always be the steadfast, faithful force, bringing life out of deathliness, hope out of despair, love out of grief, and tomorrow out of the shambles of our todays. Our creed reminds us, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. May it be so. Amen. The stories and the spirit move through us so that we continually hear of God's steadfast love. Now gathered here as God's beloved children, we can respond to what God has done. We make our gifts of tithes and offerings, our talents and abilities, our presence and our love in the sure and certain hope that God will continue to move amongst us and create the ministry we all need. And Francis will lead us in a prelude as a way of remembering this. Will you join me in prayer? You invite us to offer our pain, our burdens, our troubles to you, and we do so easily. Yet when you challenge us to offer our abundance for others, we resist and grumble. Help us to become as welcoming, as caring, as generous as you, loving God, as we share our gifts with you and the world. Amen. And now we welcome Martha King, who comes to us from halfway across the continent, and she is going to lead us in the prayers of intercession. Greeting, faithful and present God. We are gathered today separate but together in our hearts. We are grateful for the technology we've been so fortunate to have, that we can rejoice in community, see our loved ones and worship together. We are thankful for summer weather 
rain, thunderstorms, and shine, which together provides fruit and vegetables of the season and a chance for family fun in this our beautiful Okanagan Valley. We pray that friends and families gather in happy times and stay safe in all they do. Boating, swimming, wakeboarding, hiking, and camping. We also know there are some among us who are not able to experience the joy of the season due to health issues, absence of friends or family, or lack of resources. We hope they know that God's love is all around them and that the prayers of our hearts surround them. Thank you for all those who are leading in worship today, lectors, ministers, musicians, technicians, sound engineers, Facebook posters, and backup leaders. Your loving attention to our service provides a seamless opportunity for worship together. We pray also for our provincial and federal leaders during this challenging pandemic. God, give them the wisdom to help make good decisions and the courage to carry them out. This week, we also pray for Cordova Bay United Church and their minister, William Cantillon. We think of those who are experiencing homelessness, marginalized, and the rejected. We pray for people in other parts of our country who are forced due to COVID restrictions to stay home, in many cases with their own abusers. God, keep them safe. We also remember our sister community in El Triunfo, El Salvador. And now Tanya Pritchard will share with us our congregational prayer requests and concerns. Thank you, Martha. So nice to see you. This morning, we would like to pray for the family of Bill Adamson, Miro Nagy, Polly Campbell, Janet Smith, beloved Susan Seal, Lauren Aston, Barbara Sparrow, and Pamela Broadhurst. And now we join in the words that Jesus taught his disciples to say. Creator in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join us for singing. Our closing hymn is Bless Now, O God of the Journey. And you'll see some words up on the screen.
say a word of thanks to Bartha for that beautiful prayer and to Tanya for the prayers as well. To Francis for helping so much with the service this morning. It's, uh, it's always uh, interesting when you're missing the, your other half partner of this process to uh, see how other people could come in and to all those who have worked behind the scenes to make things flow well. And to all of you, there's been as many as 62 screens connected this morning, and that's been wonderful. We're about to uh, take a break and move into the uh, breakout rooms, a chance for you to chat with one another and to share a bit of your own life's journey and stories. If you're going to leave us, we would wish you well and know that you go with our love and our prayers. If you're going to stay, just wait and you will get a chance to join in. Thank you for being here. Join us again next week. And my friends, as we go, go forth in peace to live in Jesus' most joyful command, come to me and may we follow him into a rest that bears fruit in justice, love and peace for each of us and all of us. May it be so. Amen. Francis, and who says that we can't be in more than one place at the same time? It's wonderful. Thank you. Now we're going to move into that time where we uh, get a chance to move into breakout rooms. And as soon as I get the hosting back, I can do that to you or for you or with you. There we go.